it's my pleasure today to introduce you to uh, Marsha Page White. She's the Senior Director of Innovation and Implementation at the Burt Nash Center. Uh, after 25 years in the substance abuse treatment field, uh, she joined Burt Nash four years ago as the Director of Adult Services, and a year ago moved into the role of Senior Director in charge of bringing the Certified Community, yeah, let me try that again, Certified Community Behavioral Health Center designation to the agency. There's a lot of paperwork for that long title. It's, <laughs> I, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so Marsha received her bachelor's degree in family life, human development, and social work from Kansas State University. But she redeemed herself by getting her <laughs> <laughs> in social welfare from the University of Kansas. Uh, Marsha and her family moved to Lawrence almost four years ago. Marsha, thank you so much, and welcome to, uh, to uh, this forum. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have the clicker. I'm ready to go. Yeah, we, um, I have um, actually, actually started out my career um, in Douglas County. Um, uh, after I got my master's degree, I stayed here for a little while and worked in the community. Um, and then um, commuted back and forth to Kansas City for about four years and decided I needed to move there. And so lived in Kansas City for about 25 years. And then um, an opportunity arose to come back to Douglas County. And I said it was, I was very thrilled to come back to Lawrence. There was just one small problem with the town. And in, I said this during my interview, and somebody's like, well, what's that problem? And I'm like, there's this pesky bird that flies around. <laughs> I am a K-Stater through and through. But don't hold that against me, because I do have my degree from KU. Um, so I'm here today to talk about mental health and the aging population. And um, if I am talking about something and you have a question, please feel free to, to chat. Let's, let's chat about this. Um, and so um, I'm just going to start here. Hopefully today what I'm going to cover is identifying some of the symptoms of mental health in older adults by looking at some common warning signs. Um, we'll discuss strategies for talking about mental health issues and then look at some practical strategies to work towards recovery. So that's kind of what I hope that you get today. If you don't, you can fire me, okay? I won't be offended. So mental health in the elderly. One in five um, experience either a mental health or substance use disorder, both in, uh, in the elderly, or both in the elderly. So one in five of us, as we get older, are gonna either experience some mental health issues or some substance use issues with that. 10 to 15% of the population, elderly population, is impacted. Alcohol and medication uh, misuse often goes underdiagnosed in the elderly population. And the most common things that we see that happen as we get older are um, dementia or depression, um, some anxiety, or substance use disorder. So I'm gonna talk mostly about those top three um, that we uh, experience as we get older. And I am in that older population as well. Um, a fourth of the deaths by self-harm are uh, from folks who are 60 years or older. And oftentimes we think of people who die by suicide as, some, uh, as somebody who's younger, but really when we think about that, one in four people um, who die by suicide are in that elderly population. So we'll talk about anxiety and depression um, to start with start with. Anxiety, I think, is kind of a normal part of life, right? We get anxious about doing new things and about a reaction to stress or problems, that kind of stuff. So it's kind of a normal thing that a lot of people go through in their life. When it becomes problematic is when you feel very anxious, so much so that it stops you from doing the daily things in your life. Um, and so if I become kind of immobilized um, and I'm no longer able to do some of those tasks that I usually do in life, that's the kind of anxiety that we're talking about that starts to interfere um, with what's going on with us. And we need to start looking at that from that mental health um, perspective and not just is that I have a lot going on. Does that make sense? Okay, so some of the symptoms of anxiety. I start to feel very shaky, anxious, um, panicky feeling. 
I may feel dizzy, have a lot of headaches or confusion about what's going on, uh, muscle tension, soreness, uh, fatigue. I start forgetting a lot of things. And I'm like, why can't I remember this? But if my anxiety is really high, I don't have a lot of mental capacity for other things that are going on. So I feel like I'm kind of losing my mind. And then it kind of starts this cycle of I can't remember things and oh my gosh, I can't remember things and I can't remember this and I can't remember this. So those kind of symptoms start to all go in there together. We may see people who really change in how, what they're eating, how often they're eating, uh, changes in weight, and that can be both ways. I either start to lose a lot of weight or I start to gain a lot of weight because I'm just eating to try to help myself feel better. Um, you uh, may experience not wanting to leave your home. I'm just gonna stay at home. I don't wanna be around other people. I'm just gonna be um, in my space. Because if I'm not around other people, then I don't have to think about what they're saying or if they're asking me questions or that kind of stuff. Um, I can start to have some really obsessive or compulsive thoughts, thoughts that just keep running through my head over and over and over again that I can't get out of my mind. Um, I may also have uh, avoidance of activities, places, people, all of that kind of stuff. To have some difficulty um, breathing, have feeling nauseous, having digestion problems. Like I'm, I'm, I'm nauseous all the time, I don't wanna eat. If I eat, I may have other kinds of problems that go along with that. And some irrational thoughts, irritability, we see a lot of irritability that goes along with anxiety, especially in our elder population. Like they get cranky and you're like, well, that's a cranky grandma there. <laughs> like, goodness. Um, my um, dad um, probably is experiencing some of these anxiety symptoms now. And um, I have a 10 year old. And when my 10 year old is with us and we go down to the farm, my dad gets super cranky with him. And I just look at my dad, I'm like, uh-uh, uh-uh. But I know some of it's, it's, it's a lot of stimulation and there's some anxiety stuff that's going on. And I get it, but it also, as a family member, it doesn't really feel that good. Because you're like, come on, pull it together. Well, it's not as simple as just pulling it together, right? It's really thinking about this not as someone's choice to be anxious, but they have some stuff that's going on that are a part of those symptoms that are causing that, and we need to look at what that's about. Does that make sense to everybody? Anybody relate? Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. So there's oftentimes some triggers related to um, that, and we think about this as we start to get older, right? So what are, some of those triggers could be financial insecurity. Like, do I have enough money to live the rest of my life? Where is all my money at? My dad, we have to remind him continually, this is where your money's at, this is what's going on, and a, a $20 bill throws him into a panic attack almost. <coughs> my dad has more than $20, he's gonna be fine. But for him, it's that whole awareness, like my mom's in a nursing home, how am I gonna pay for your mom in a nursing home, what am I gonna do with this? All, so it's all of that stuff starts to come in uh, in that. Um, we start to see health problems, immobility or chronic pain. We do know that what happens in our head oftentimes has an impact on our body, right? And oftentimes when we can't talk about the pain that I'm having in my head, but I can easily talk about the pain that I'm having in my body. And so we don't connect those sometimes. And so what we see is what happens up here starts to come out in our body. You know, I feel slower, I don't, you know, I don't feel good, I don't wanna do that. And the not feeling good sometimes is really not a physical thing, it's more of an emotional thing, but it comes out as a physical thing. Um, dementia, there's some real things that happen in terms of um, our brain as we age. And oftentimes that dementia can trigger some of that anxiety that's going on there. Loss of independence or isolation. And I know I'm, I'm gonna talk about my dad, but my dad's a farmer. He lives on a farm in Southeast Kansas. My mom's been in the nursing home for a couple of years. Um, and he's there at home by himself all the time. 
And he stopped doing some of the things that he used to, he used to go up to coffee every morning with the farmers, you know, and talk about the weather and the roads and all that kind of stuff. Well, he stopped doing that. He used to be the maintenance man for the water district, so he kept the books for the water district. And he had his own office uptown and he stopped doing that. And so his isolation has started to increase, which I think increases some of that anxiety that goes along with that. The end of life planning, you start to think about, well, how am I going to live out the rest of my days? What's gonna happen with me? Am I gonna go to a nursing home? Do I have enough money to pay for a nursing home? Who's gonna take care of the farm? Who's gonna do all of these kinds of stuff? So all of those things start to play into this and then can trigger some of that anxiety and then grief and loss. As we know, as we get older, the people that we know in our life start to, you know, leave us. Um, we have more of our friends who are dying, more of our friends who are being placed in nursing homes who don't have that, aren't able to have that same kind of relationship with us. So those are some of those triggers that we start to see for what happens with some of that anxiety. Depression. Um, depression is, um, we start to, the thing that I wanna say here is, we start to lose interest in our things and it's longer for a longer period of two weeks or more. So I have something that happens to me and I feel really down today, but I'm able to kind of pick myself up over the next couple of weeks. That's not what we're talking about in terms of clinical depression. When we start to talk about clinical depression, we're talking about something that lasts longer than what you would see episodically going on. Where we lose, um, we're feeling really sad, really down, pretty miserable, we lose interest, we lose pleasure. Um, and we lose um, the desire to do a lot of our usual activities. So depression, um, we're talking about an episode that's greater than two weeks. We're talking about the loss of interest in activities. Um, you may see a lot of the kind of these symptoms that start to occur. Um, and we wanna make sure that if it is depression, if there's four or more of these that are happening. So changes in my appetite or weight I start to lose weight, I'm not hungry anymore, I'm not that kind of stuff. My sleep patterns start to change. I'm not, I'm having a difficult time falling asleep. I'm having a difficult time staying asleep. I'm not sleeping as much, or maybe I'm sleeping more. I go to bed at seven o'clock and don't get up until 10 o'clock the next morning. And so the changes in that sleep that starts to happen. Um, some slowing down of our psychomotor activity. Um, decreased energy, feelings of worthlessness or guilt, um, difficulty thinking, concentrating, or remembering. People tell you something and you like, I've never heard that before. Um, recurrent thoughts of death or suicide or, or suicidal ideation or suicide plans or attempts. And so if we start to think about that and we're having four or more of these, this really has moved into some clinical depression. It's not just being sad. It's really a depressive state. Um, and we also think about that, that all of that's accompanied by my inability to um, function in my life as I normally had. So my functioning level greatly decreases with that. Um, chronic major depressive disorder or dysthymia is two of these symptoms over at least two years period of time. So dysthymia is what we kind of call like low grade depression. Um, and, it's, um, and it's over a longer period of time. Um, sadness, um, oftentimes um, people will identify, oh, you're just sad or um, this depression is, you know, it's not really depression. And we really have to start to think about like what is really going on here. Sadness, there's oftentimes there's psychosomatic complaints um, in which um, we, we talk about our body's aches and pains rather than our feelings. And I just talked about this. It's so much easier to say, gosh, my back just really hurts versus I'm really sad and my heart hurts, you know, or I'm really sad and I just, you know, um, don't feel like myself. Um, we have an increased um, irritability, and I just talked about that as well. Oftentimes we start to lose interest in the things that had interested in us in the past, whatever that might be. Like I was just talking about my dad. He 
every single day went up to the cafe or when the cafe in the town shut down up to the schoolhouse he made the coffee he sat with those people he talked with them they were his best friends for years and years and years and a couple of things happened with that one his hearing started to be affected and so he started not hearing as well um, but then he started losing interest in going up there and I think some of it's a combination of all the physical stuff and then just really you know he's getting to that point where I think he's really sad about being out on the farm by himself and his kids aren't there and his wife's not there and so some of that going on we see that reduction or or increase in appetite so you see people either losing some weight with that or gaining a lot of weight with that but the weight that they had been stable at for a long time starts to change um, and then uh, maybe some psychomotor changes and inability to stay um, still um, pulling of your skin, slow speech or slow thinking, um, a sense of worthlessness or guilt, and again, thoughts of suicide or attempts of suicide. So some of the symptoms that we see with depression go along this, and I'm not going to go over all of these, but you have the behaviors, which are generally that slowing down, um, not taking care of myself, not getting close to people, withdrawing, kind of isolating from others. We have the thoughts that go along with that. My loss of self-esteem, not being able to make decisions, um, uh, thinking of uh, excessive financial concerns, um, worried about how people are gonna start to see me or what people start to think of me. We have feelings that go along with this. So some of the moodiness that happens, some of the really sadness or the emptiness that happens maybe feeling very overwhelmed. So overwhelmed I can't even make a decision about what to do. And then we have some of the physical symptoms that I just kind of talked about. You know, the sleeping more, feeling tired, uh, slow movements, memory problems, all of that. So those are some of the things that we see that go along with depression. Okay, addiction. Um, so with the addiction, some of what we're talking about is the um, use of alcohol, or prescription drug dependence. Um, so I worked for 25 years in the field of addiction. Um, that's what I did before I came here to Lawrence. And one of the fastest growing areas that we've seen a lot is in that prescription drug um, addiction. It grew really rapidly until some of the doctors started like going, oh, and some of the uh, DEA started going, oh, why are you prescribing so many? Um, and I think there's a couple of things that happen with this in our senior population with prescription drugs. One, we grew up in a time where doctors were always right, right? You do exactly what the doctor says and the doctor knows best, right? And we do have some problems going on with our body as we are getting older, right? Um, and so we go to the doctor to get that fixed and we don't question what the doctor gets us and after a while, my one pill bottle is 30 pill bottles on my cabinet and I'm trying to remember when I take what, when, how, and how much. And then I may be really confused about what I'm supposed to do and so I may overtake my medication over time. I'm supposed to have this one in the morning, noon, and night. Um, and I don't remember if I took it this morning so I'm going to just take another one. And I don't remember if I take it at night or not, so I'll just take one to be safe. And so what we see with that is just a very, very innocently um, uh, this addiction to prescription medicine growing in our elderly population. And before long, we have folks who are kind of addicted to whatever medication that they can be placed on rather innocently um, without um, knowing what they're getting into because the doctor knows best and I'm just doing what the doctor says. We also see um, many medical conditions um, or behavior disorders that mimic symptoms, right? So if I'm, uh, let's say that I start to lose my appetite and depression isn't something that all of a sudden a flashing light happens on your forehead. You're depressed, you're depressed, you're depressed. But I'm like going, you know, I just don't feel good lately and my stomach hurts a lot, right? 
Well, if I don't relate that to what's going on up here, and I present to my doctor for it, my doctor's not gonna treat up here, right? What's he gonna do? He's gonna treat my stomach, right? And so we have symptoms that come out that look very different um, based on if this is like a mental part of stuff that's going on or a, be, uh, or a physical thing, and those get confused in there. And so I may continually present at my physician's office instead of going and saying, look, something's not right up here because it's much harder to talk about what I'm thinking about than it is to talk about how I'm feeling, right? And then we have a, yes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we went clear the other way. Oh, you don't feel good, let me treat you. Oh, your toe hurts, let me give you some pills for it. You know, yeah. Um, and so some trigger events are kind of, if you'll see this, it's just the same as with the other mental health things that we talked about. So retirement, you know, all of a sudden I've lost my purpose for what I've done in my, uh, life. My father was a farmer for many, 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 many years. And not only was he a farmer, he was a hog farmer. And if you are a hog farmer, you never get a day off because you are always feeding the hogs, moving the hogs, chasing the hogs, checking on the hogs twice a day, every day for his whole entire life. He did things with hogs. Once our hogs were gone, what did he do with his time, right? Then he had cows, so we had cows for a long time. And he also farmed too. And so then he had cows, so he checked on his cows for a long time, and after a while, the cows were gone. And then he sold off all his tractors and all his things. And so what does he do? Right now, he cuts wood. We have a whole barn stacked with wood that he could not burn in 50 years, I swear. Um, but that, it's like you start to lose what you do. That retirement triggers some of that stuff. Death in family members, people who are close, loss of income, um, all of that kind of stuff. And I'm gonna run out of time if I'm not careful. Um, so the so signs of drug usage um, are those kinds of things, changes in sleeping habits, unexplained bruises, um, in, uh, sadness, depression, chronic pain, eating, wanting to be alone, uh, failing to bathe or clean yourself, um, not paying attention to your overall self-care, losing, touch, losing touch with loved ones, why do I lose touch with loved ones? Because I don't want them to come around and see what I'm doing, right? So how do we talk about it? How do we help? Many problems can be prevented with education and information. So just really understanding what mental health is really about and educating yourself and getting in some information. Familiarizing yourself with the conditions and the impact that it has on the elderly. So understanding, like for me, understanding that as my dad gets older, he, this could be some real depression that's going on. And my brothers and sisters, we talk about that. I think dad's depressed, I think he is too. What are we gonna do? Um, we have those conversations. Now my mom has mental health issues and we've known that all our life, so we've got a good handle on mom. It's dad that we're now thinking about. And so it's that kind of understanding that, familiarizing yourself, all of that kind of stuff. Caregivers or anybody that we know that are in the elderly life need to be able to recognize problems and overcome our own discomfort in having these conversations about it. Like we have to have conversations with my dad. We have to talk about that. Being respectful, um, asking opening questions, questions that elicit more than a yes or no, giving space um, to folks. When my mom is really anxious, I can't ask her a question that she has to answer right away, we have to have a conversation that's slow and leads up to it because she gets so anxious, she just looks at me like this. I'm like, ooh, wrong question, <laughs> wrong time. We've gotta do something different. Um, we need to be able to acknowledge worries and speak really calmly about what's going on um, and have conversations that don't bombard you with questions. I can't just ask you question after question after question after question because what happens is your anxiety is gonna go way up and you're going to just become immobilized with that and that irritability kicks in and that grumpiness and we're like, ooh, dad's testy today. Um, need to be able to use some reflective listening. What reflective listening is is saying, so what I hear you say is that you're not feeling that good today. 
you know, what have you done? You know, something like that I, that acknowledges that I hear what they're saying. We need to make sure that we're involving family members and support uh, systems. You know, making sure that you're having conversations with your family. This is what's going on. This is how you can help. This is how I need you. Um, so that they can show up in a way that makes a difference. And then if you're caring for someone, making sure that you notice differences that are happening, you know, and that you're talking about those differences that happen. And track changes. It's really important to kind of understand our level over time because sometimes things that start small um, or things that get big really started small a long time ago. And so just understanding that's helpful. Here's how we talk about that with others. We use first person language. So we say things like, I see um, that you're not feeling well today, dad. Or, you know, instead of putting that on him, you aren't feeling good, what's going on? It's like, I think, you know, it seems to me like you're not feeling good. So I give him a chance to answer that without making that accusation. I'm gonna take harmful and labeling language out of my vocabulary. You're just an addict, you're just a drunk, um, you're just crazy, you're just psycho. That's not helpful language. <laughs> Although we may think about it, it's not really that helpful to say that. And I'm not gonna make promises that this is gonna go away or it's gonna be, it, it'll be better tomorrow because it may not go away without intervention and it may not be better tomorrow. It may be worse tomorrow, but saying things like we can, we can make it through this or let me help you are those really helpful things to say. Um, we don't excuse it as, uh, don't make excuses for it being a bad day. It may really be a bad day for them, but that may be their baseline. And if you're telling them that's a bad day, then what you're telling them is that every day is a bad day. And so you just say, you know, we're just gonna make it through this. What can we do to do something, whatever that is? You know, um, don't give out advice or expect them to change. You can't will someone to change their mental health. Uh, stop being depressed. Uh, be happy. Um, that doesn't happen and those aren't helpful things to say. Um, apologize if you do say something hurtful because I'll tell you what, I left my house the other day after my dad was cranky with my son and I'm like, I'm never going back there. And my husband's like, just wait a minute. And then we went back a couple weeks later and my dad was very kind to my son. You know, so sometimes our feelings get hurt and we just need to acknowledge that, that this is on me, that that's my feelings hurt. And I don't need to be, um, and I need to, and I need to keep that in my own head. I need to take a look at my tone and intent what am I saying? How am I saying? How am I talking to people? And um, how can I be real tactful with this? So recovery, um, what we need to be aware of is um, be aware of physical limitations. We're not going to ask, my dad is not going to run a marathon. Surprise, surprise. He was a farmer for years. He's a very strong man, but he's not going to run a marathon. It's not going to happen. So I need to understand what his physical limitations are. What can he do? What can he not do? And I need to honor and respect that and not ask him or expect him to do things that he can't do. Um, I also need to respect individual preferences. My dad has this funny way of eating right now, he, but he's very routine for him and he's very healthy with it, but it's just funny. And I'm not gonna go in there and tell him how to change his eating right now because it works for him. He never cooked a meal until my mom left the home and now he's fending for himself and he's figuring out how to do it. But I'm not going to, I need to respect his individual preferences. I need to think about what it is that works for him in this space. Um, we need to address worries that can be handled. So if the depression is related to financial stuff, let's get a financial planner. Let's get someone in there that helps take a look at this from this different perspective. My brother goes up every week. They lay out all the bills on the table. He's got a binder for him. We're doing this with this dad, we're doing this with this, we're taking this, here's this check that goes to the bank. They have it all played out and they all, he, know, he does it every week. So it's that, we're gonna address what we need to do. We're gonna engage in a support system or create new support systems. Who is around to help our, uh, you if you're experiencing some mental health? Who are the people that you can lean into? Who are your friends? Who's your family? Who's your go-to? I'm my mom's go-to. I talk to her every single day. I call her on the phone, we FaceTime, we chat. 
every single day. I read her Harry Potter at night with my son. We're reading together. That's the kind of support system that we build, right? Because that's where my mom's needs are. We encourage social activities. For a long time, my mom sat in her room at the nursing home. Mom, get out, they have things. She's finally started getting out. It took a long time. She's out crafting. They, she's made me a couple of snowmen. She's painted, she's done things that she hadn't done before. But that's like, what are those activities that you can engage in that make your life meaningful for where you're at? Uh, movement, move, 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 move. If you are depressed, you know, one of the best things for depression is movement. If you're sitting down, stand up. If you're standing up, sit down, do something, move. Walk around your house, walk to, through your living room three times. Every commercial, stand up and go to the kitchen and get a drink of water. It's that movement that helps start to create some energy. Work on stress management techniques. Think about how do you do to breathe? How do you, is prayer important to you? How do you center yourself to calm some of that anxiety, to help with some of the thinking that goes on? Exercise is super important. And avoiding a lot of caffeine, you can have your coffee, but you shouldn't be drinking 20 cups of coffee in a day. I mean, just thinking about that. Um, avoid overeating, oversleeping. If you're depressed, it's really easy to stay in bed. Make, make sure if you go to bed at seven o'clock at night, you're getting up at seven o'clock in the morning. You don't sleep till 10, 11, 12, you know. You set your routine, you live by your routine, and you go from there. Um, making sure that we're really calm and reassuring, acknowledging fears, um, but I'm not gonna play along. Like, I don't play along with my dad. I understand that you're worried about your finances, but let's talk about this, you know. Um, being supportive, um, supporting their anxiety, I understand that this is overwhelming for you. What can we do here in this here and now? Offering assistance, um, offering to get them mental health professional if that's what's needed. Um, limit current news if it's overwhelming. Sometimes listening to all the news and all the media and stuff is just way too overwhelming. I think I listen to the news like once a week. It's too much for me, and I'm not. I'm older, but uh, it's just too much. Seek out medication if it's appropriate. And there's, there's appropriate medication for mental health. Um, so um, not just thinking about we're really easy to get physical health medication. We should be as open to getting some mental health medication if it's needed. And engaging in therapy. We have at Burton Ash, we have a lot of people who are older who come in for therapy, who need it. And they're like, okay, this is what's going on with me. How can I get some help? Okay, I went through a lot of that really, really fast. Who has questions or things that you want to talk about? Yes. Well, I just want to know if anxiety and depression are, go together always. It can, okay. not always. Not always. Okay. Not always. And sometimes um, your depression could look like anxiety. So that's where it's really important that you find maybe a mental health professional to help you with that. For a long time, my mom went to her uh, doctor for her psychi psychiatric needs, and I'm like, Mom, he takes care of your toes. You know, let him take care of your toes. Let's find someone to take care of your brain because it's kind of a specialized thing. And so it's hard to get in, though. It is hard very, to get in. Very, very. very I, I will acknowledge that it is hard to get in. Um, and our pandemic did not help us. We see that at Burton Ash. It's like that the need for mental health is is great. Um, and so, but the other thing that I would say with that is that if you have a good primary care physician, that's a good place to at least start having that conversation um, and not just going to see your primary care physician because you have a bunion. I think it's okay to go to your primary care physician and say, I've been feeling really depressed lately and I think I need to address my depression there are a lot of primary care physicians that can start you on some really low doses of antidepressants that could be really helpful. Um, and so I would say really engage in your caregivers in that conversation. Yeah, it's a great question though. Yes? How could we get a couple of print screens of some of your, any changes? Um, yes, um, he, you have my slides so now. I, so I'll be putting the slides, the video, but we'll have the slides included. And if you're okay with that on this, on yep. the, we'll, we'll provide a link so you can download the, the presentation. 
Yep. Perfect, because some of the yep. earlier slides that symptoms, yes. those were really too yeah. much to write down. But oh, no, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm totally okay with you taking whatever you have and, 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 and helping them get it, yeah, yeah. Um, yes? <clears throat> when you mentioned limit uh, current news if it's overwhelming, um, apparently sometimes family news, like our oldest son's wife is divorced, you know, mm -hmm. we're not letting my mother know at all. Yeah. There's not, I hope there's never anybody that breathes anything like that. But, you know, I realized even though I'd love to talk with her because she used to be my talk person, it would be too much. Right. Yeah, I think there's some. There's a lot of things we don't talk with my mom and dad about. We're just like, uh, I, I'm very, very fortunate. I have two older sisters and a younger brother, and we are very, very close. Um, and we see each other a lot. I'm the one that lives the farthest away, and so when I go down, which is only two hours away, when I go down to see my parents, they all come together and we all talk. But we oftentimes sneak off into the other room to have a conversation, and we don't bring it to mom and dad. It's just, they just don't need to know. They just don't need to know. And um, like I say, I talk to my mom every day, and she's like, well, how's your day? And if I've had a hard day, I say, oh, mom, I had to have a lot of adult conversations. Well, what's going on, honey? It was just a lot of work, mom. Just work today. How was your day? You know, like I don't, I don't, I used to tell her all the details and, you know, go into all of that. But what would happen is my mom would start to worry about, oh, is my little girl okay? Is my baby okay? my baby. I am almost 60 years old. <laughs> I'm, not, I, I'm still her baby. Um, but yeah, so I think that's really okay to do. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Have you heard about this new theory going around about diabetes 3 and how sugar crystals form in your brain and you are diabetic but you don't know it? Have you been through any of that? Okay, so let me just tell you this. Um, two years ago, my 10-year-old son was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And so he is um, a kiddo who is on a continuous glucose monitor and an insulin pump. So he gets insulin all the time. And so I am a part of a couple of um, diabetic communities, mostly focused on type 1. And so periphery, peripherally, I hear some about type 2, um, I haven't heard as much as what you're talking about with type 3, um, but I will say this. Um, uh, when we first got his diagnosis, um, I'm like, well, I don't really notice a difference when his blood sugar is high or low. Now, he, two years into it, when his blood sugar goes low and he gets very shaky and very kind of stuff, he's like, am I dying, Mom? Am I dying? I'm dying now. I'm dying. I'm like, oh. It's a little dramatic, and I'm like, you're not dying here, eat some Skittles. Um, <laughs> literally, that's what we say. <laughs> um, but um, when his blood sugar is high, he is the sassiest, mouthiest little kid, and I just want to strangle him. And we were at the pool probably the first summer after his diagnosis, and I see somebody who has an insulin pump on their arm, right? And so I go up, and I'm like, is that an Omnipod? And she's like, yeah, like, I, I'm just totally weird about it. And she goes, let me just tell you this. When his, high blood, when his blood sugar is high, he's not thinking clearly. I'm telling you, he is not thinking clearly. And we see that. Like, he is sassy. His comes out of sassiness. And I just want to go, oh, kid. So I do know blood sugar has a huge impact on all of us, on our thinking, how we're high and low, and all of that kind of stuff. I have not heard that research, and I have not looked into it. But I, I'm going to check it out. Okay. Yeah. I did look in JAMA, and there was a uh, an article that uh, I read in the AARP magazine. And when it comes every now and then, I would always go ARP, 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 yeah. and throw it away. But uh -huh. I'm finding there are bits and pieces that are of interest. Yeah, now. yeah. And that was one of them. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting to think about. JAMA has a good website too. You might be able to find the article. Right. J-A-M-A has a good website. Yes. You might be able to find the article. Okay. Good to know. Good to know. I do know there's sugar has an impact. And if you see a lot of the weight loss stuff right now is re directly related to um, uh, sugar in your body. People are wearing the uh, CGMs to see what their blood sugar is. 
uh, on a regular basis and people are using insulin to lose weight. I think it's kind of fascinating that that's how folks are doing it. Fascinating as I'm just trying to keep my son alive with insulin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other questions? We're having, a, we're having discussions with my um, husband's parents who live in California, so it's really hard to, um, you know, to see those changes over time, right? Because mm -hmm. we, uh, you know, we don't see them. You know, they don't have smartphones, so we can't, you know, it's always phone calls, it's not over FaceTime, so it's, it's harder to stay in touch with, um, you know, those day-to-day -day changes. And I feel like we kind of overwhelmed them. We're like, well, you need to just come, you know, move to Kansas so we can take care of you. And they just like, full stop, like. Mm -hmm. So seeing the, um, <clears throat> uh, the strategies for, you know, starting those conversations slowly and uh, working up to those big yeah. decisions. <laughs> yeah. That's really hard when people talk about being in the sandwich generation. Um, clearly, I am. I have a 10 year old and parents who are in a nursing, a nursing home. You start to, you know, it's like I never thought I would be parenting my parents kind of thing. And I want my parents to have full autonomy over their decisions. You know, what I think might be best is may not be best. When my mom got sick right before she had to go into the nursing home, like we did a lot to try to keep her in her home because that was her wishes. Um, uh, we would stay there overnight, you know, we did this rotation, luckily there's four of us, and I'm like, you stay on these nights, I'll come on this night, you do this night, you know, um, I'm coming home every weekend, like all of these kinds of things, just to try to make that happen, and it's, it's a lot, you know, and then there has to be some of those really tough, real conversations about is this possible or is it not, yeah, it's not, it's not easy. My husband and I talk about it a lot, about what happens when we get older, because we're getting older, um, and, and what we want that to look like and how we want that to, to happen, um, because our son is much, much younger, you know, than we are. And, um, so it's a, it's a challenge. It's hard for families. And I think we just have to acknowledge how hard it is for families and how many big decisions have to be made and how many times we have to think about that. And it's, it, it can be overwhelming. Yeah. Well. How about these commercials you see on TV? Take this and that for your brain, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, you know, as you age, it's only natural that you're going to be slower mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. things happen mm -hmm. as long as you're not a fanatic with it, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You see all these commercials. Your brain is sharper if you take this and take that. I'd be afraid to take all that junk. You know, I um, I, I do take some vitamins, yeah. um, and I do work out a lot, mm -hmm. and I do the things. I do think movement for as long as you can is really important, and I know movement helps your brain a lot. And so... I don't know if they're trying to bottle movement, but I would recommend, you know, a good exercise, a healthy diet, and, and good sleep. Those are three things that I would strongly, strongly encourage to anyone. Are you eating healthy? Are you sleeping well? And are you um, getting some exercise? Um, and so common sense a lot of times. Lots of common sense. 